Gracias for pressing play y welcome to Smart Chickens, a working together, smarter diversity meets innovation and growth podcast. On today's episode, we have a very special guest, Natalie Bourne. We have a very interesting conversation around her background growing up in Georgia, her college years, her journey with some major companies in the art of corporate innovation, her book recommendations to get 1% better, and also advice to recent college graduates, and her trip with Michael J. Fox and his Back to the Future DeLorean. It'll be interesting because we'll talk about the art of corporate innovation, which she's an expert in, uh, gives us some points on four attributes that are a must-have for organizations that are trying to level up their corporate innovation game. Um, talks about market disruption is no longer about individuals, it's about teams. And a third point of view that she has around corporate innovation is there are three core things that shift when an organization brings innovation to the forefront. And those three things are the cultural shift, the market shift, and engagement shifts. All she will talk about a little bit here on this podcast today, this episode. As always, this podcast is brought to you by our good friends at digitechy.com, a conversational marketing demand gen and revenue accelerator consultancy, and gypsyforever.com, uniquely handmade wellness products that help you connect your mind, body, and soul to achieve a better balanced you. A little bit about Natalie's background. So Natalie Bourne is a VP of Innovation in, uh, for Territory Global, and she's also the founder and host of the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. Uh, Natalie has spent 15 years plus designing and creating products with the goal of creating customer delight. As an innovation consultant, she brings uh, helps her clients move from idea to execution. She has contributed to two approved US patents, and during her career, and is passionate about helping organizations leverage the incredible talents they have to create the outcomes they want. Natalie has worked with organizations such as Career Builder, First Data, IHG, and ADP, leading major initiatives in acquisition, integration, and international product development in over 18 countries. Throughout her career, she's authored numerous articles and speaks on the national circuit. So, vamos, let's dive into the show, and without further ado, Here's Natalie Bourne. Broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find a fighter, but I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out. Move mountains, we gon' walk it out and move. I love it. Good song. Let me see if I uh, pause it so that I can uh, get back to us a little bit. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, um, hey, that song actually, it's touching. Yeah. And with everything we're going through, I think that the fact that someone is showing that kind of empathy in a relationship and yeah. that kind of care kind of goes into a little bit of what your whole innovation strategy for organization comes into as well. So Love That's that right. song, and thanks for being on uh, this episode of Smart Chickens. Absolutely. It's a podcast dedicated to diversity in the form of thinking, so more than just skin deep, and how that's impacting uh, our workforce, you know, uh, today and hopefully into the future. So welcome. 
Um, I'd be a, a little bit, um, you know, digress if I didn't say a little bit about your background. And I'll let you also say it. But I did some research and I was quite impressed um, with your educational background as well as the, the juggernauts of companies you worked for out yeah. of, uh, it seems like in Atlanta, um, out of Georgia, right? That's right. So, um, you know, tell me a little bit about that journey because you're a native of Georgia, uh, yes. correct me if I'm wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It looks like you did your education in your hometown. Yes. Um, outside of Maryland, where you also had your degree. And you did a bit of an abroad experience uh, doing a, 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 in your master's for international business in India. Yes. Which is pretty awesome. So walk us through, first and foremost, what was your journey like growing up in Georgia? And were there any kind of, you know, challenges, anything that sticks out that you can say, you know what, Gianni, uh, that sort of shaped me into getting into the, the, the degrees, uh, you know, that I got and also into the career that I'm in. Absolutely. I mean, I feel like growing up in my childhood, I was the only one, um, you know, in a small town in Duluth, Georgia, there was not a lot of minorities at the time. In the 80s, there was not a ton of diversity in Georgia. And so for a long time, I, you know, what shaped me in my childhood was being different, like just noticing that I was different than everybody else. And so I think, you know, I despised that when I was young. I despised being different. But um, as I grew older, I realized how special it is to be different and how special it is to be able to embrace differences and to bring those differences to the table. So it wasn't until middle school that I actually saw other people that were, you know, that that looked and I won't even say looked like me. They looked similar to me. <laughs> and to be able to kind of get outside the box and say, hey, you know, what are these different experiences we all have? So when I, I kind of took that into my, my college years and I feel like, you know, I, I did go to school at Oglethorpe, which is in Atlanta, but mm -hmm. I also was working almost full time. So I was carrying like a full time load and then also paying for it by, by working as well. And so um, I think the challenge for me was just continuing to try to break through doors that no one else that looked like me was in. And um, after graduating, even going into technology, again, a lot of times I was the only person at the table that looked like me. And a lot of times I was the only woman at the table. So um, I, I think because I went through that as a child, it was easier for me to embrace that as an adult. Wow, that's great. And yeah, I, um, I can empathize. I, I came here from overseas from Ecuador with my, my family in 84. And even though it's South Florida, which there's a lot of Hispanic you know, uh, uh, folks, we were first originally in DC, um, a little bit outside of DC. Um, so I, I recall that, uh, you know, there wasn't a huge Hispanic population back then. And so in class, you know, I remember being sort of the odd man out. Yeah. Um, I had, I think I became really good friends with a, with a gentleman named Patrick Watt, he's Jamaican. And so we kind of, res you know, we kind of fed off each other, I think, because we were the only two people of color in the classroom. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But I, I can understand what you're saying. So yeah. talk me through, you know, you've had an incredible journey. I, I looked and saw that career builder, you know, mm -hmm. ADP, these are fortune 500 companies, right? Yeah. And you work your way up. Now there's, there's folks that, that say that oper, you know, that uh, success happens at the intersection of oper when opportunity meets, um, you know, um, preparation. Yeah. What was that sort of break that got you, you know, out of college, when you got out of college, you were still working, but got you into your position, let's say at Career Builder, where, where it all started? Sure. You know, it's funny you saying that. I, um, a lot of people talk about luck. I personally don't believe in luck. I believe in a lot of hard work. And one of the things that, you know, um, that really stood out to me was because I had this feeling of always being different my whole life. I somehow told myself the story that I had to work twice as hard as everyone else to get ahead. And whether that was true or not, that narrative played in my mind for a very long time. So every job I went to, I worked twice as hard as everybody else. And so, um, you know, I had this just drive and this passion to to be better. So when I started at CareerBuilder, we were actually headhunter.net at the time. We got bought by CareerBuilder. And then what was interesting was we had a reverse merger where CareerBuilder, um, where headhunter leadership came back into the company and took it over as career builder. So I got my job back. It was one of these things where we were all losing our job. And then, you know, we find out a week later, no, you're coming back as career builder. So 
it's I've never seen a reverse merger like that before. But one of the powerful things with that was each job I went into, I I gave it 150 percent. And so I I was always I always had this like restlessness in me of of wanting more, wanting to do more, wanting to see more for my life and understanding that you know, I have to do well in the job I'm in in order to get to that next role. And so always approaching things with, okay, this is the bare minimum. How do I over deliver? How do I knock it out of the park? How do I um, succeed far beyond what people's expectations would be of me? That's great. And and I agree with you. I know that uh, folks do talk about luck, but there is really a lot of hard work that actually leads you into this luck. So people that believe in the law of attraction, the harder you work, the more energy you put into whatever your craft is, that um, coincidence that you think is a coincidence, probably not a coincidence. Actually, it's all leading up to all that hard work that you've been putting in the background and the behind the scenes, right? So yeah, I I would, I would agree with that. So then take me through, you know, your journey when, when you got, you know, out of, out of sort of this corporate um, environment at the ADPs of the world, career builders and such, and then you went on an entrepreneurial journey. I so did. coming from a place of, you know, I'm also a person of color, right? Um, and, and an entrepreneur, um, a founder that, that's Latinx. Uh, tell me what your challenges and opportunities had been when you created your, your you know, your entrepreneurial, you know, your, your, your podcast as part of it and your consulting. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that's so unique about being an entrepreneur is I think from the outside looking in, people see it as a very glamorous lifestyle where you kind of write your own schedule and, and you do all these things, you know, that you want to do. But I think what people don't realize is the level of risk that you're taking on as is, is being an entrepreneur and also the opportunity cost. Um, that you're missing out on by not having a big corporate salary, right? So <laughs> there's there's this level of, you know, what do I really want for myself? And I, and I think that, you know, you get to this point where you have enough experience under your belt, you've worked on enough um, ideas for other organizations that you really want to launch something that you can call your own. And for me, um, part of what I wanted to launch was this ability to reach back and say, gosh, I've been doing this for a very long time. I've been in corporate for more than 15 years and I've been doing this for a very, very long time. And so to be able to look back and say, let me just walk you through some of the things that I learned the hard way um, around how to team with people, around how to create products that that people care about, um, around how to present ideas to executives in a way that it resonates. And um, even the idea of, you know, not choosing the hardest battle when you're new to an organization, but getting some wins under your belt before you actually launch into saying, okay, now that I've charged these small hills, let's go take this mountain. So just the, you know, sometimes we have the audacity as when we're younger to come in and be like, I want that mountain. And they're like, well, who are you? Uh, and, and, you know, you haven't shown us anything. And so just being able to get some small wins under your belt and build to, to what you want to do in life. And I think that when you look back, I think you're ready to start something when it's not about you anymore. And I finally got to the place where my career wasn't about me anymore. It was about what could I do to help other people think outside the box, break some of the barriers that they have to ideating and creating and help see people, you know, freed from their mind. I think our mind a lot of times holds us back from being and doing what we're called to do and and be. Uh, that's some great input and insight. And I, I agree with you that once over time, I'm the fourth floor, right? I'm in my 40s. So I think every decade that goes by that um, cumulative knowledge that, you know, and the, the business acumen that, that you um, start, start store, storing, mm-hmm. um, you start thinking outside of your own career, what else can I do to bring some of this knowledge forward, right? Or how can I help the next generation? Or what else can I do that really is an impact? So to, to sort of to what you're saying, I can understand how we get that scratch. We want to, you know, scratch our own itch, which is to become the CEO of YOU, right. give up corporate and, uh, you know, and all, all the good and bad that comes with corporate because there, there are false sense of stability, as you know, in corporate, but you do get compensated in a way that you feel that you're stable at least versus yeah. an entrepreneur that you're kind of flying by the, the seat of your pants, even though you might be as organized as you possibly can be. And you still do feel like uh, you don't have, you know, um, a cushion, if you will, right? Whereas corporate, I think you feel 
even though I think it's a false sense of security, that there is a cushion, right? That's right. Uh, what, That's right. what has been your experience? And I'm very curious about this because it's coming from a place of firsthand experience and being a person um, that has diversity within their, their, their upbringing and culture. At organizations like the career builders and ADPs, what did you see as an evolution or lack thereof around workforce diversity and yeah. equity and opportunity for growth? Yeah, you know, it's it's a challenge, I think, in every large organization. Some do it much better than others. Um, and I, you know, I've spent some time blogging on this topic because it's so it's such a big topic. And what's hard um, is I think a lot of corporations sometimes they want to check the box that they're diverse and they want to, you know, either insert a course or something, a class you have to go to, to talk about diversity. But that's just the very begin, like that's just scratching the surface, right? I think there are some key fundamental things that have to take place in order to say that you're on that path. I mean, I think it's looking at your hiring practices. Um, Cheryl Sandberg talks about this a lot, but she talks about this idea that until you have a diverse set of candidates, how can you possibly pull the trigger on hiring that person? You know, until you are actively talking about biases, right? Conscious and unconscious biases within your organization. How do you really know that you're, you're on this path until you're calling things out and, you know, kind of pulling that elephant into the middle of the room and painting it red and saying, this is what we're dealing with in our society today. Until you are intentional about these things, intentional about ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to be promoted. And that doesn't mean everyone will be promoted, but ensuring people have the same opportunities for that to happen. These are some of the things that are, are critical. And I think the most important thing is looking at executive teams and executive, you know, and looking at their boards and saying, is there diversity there? And I think this is an area where a lot of companies struggle. So they want to talk about diversity inclusion, but we kind of just scratch the surface to, to check the box. And I think there's a deeper level that we can go to, which is having the conversation and looking at our hiring practices and looking at who's on our executive team and boards. And, and that's, that's really when you know you're, you're moving the needle on that. All right, well said. And I would, I would say that obviously in light of the, the civil unrest that we've had over the last couple of months, um, I've seen quite a bit of feed um, feeds in, in LinkedIn from large organizations. Uh, for example, SoftBank was one of the first, Marcelo Claude, who actually was from here from South Florida, originally from Bolivia, came here. His, his whole thing is a dream, uh, American dream come true as well story. And, uh, you know, SoftBank um, that, that, that own, um, you know, Sprint slash T-Mobile and just a ton of other organizations, WeWalk, uh, that they just uh, bought last year, you know, they put in a, I, I believe a hundred million dollar fund just for people of color. But then, you know, people look at that and think, okay, great. May, are they scratching that box? Right. Cause Google did the same thing. Facebook, everyone else under the sun started doing the same thing. But I was uh, actually pleased to see that the post that happened maybe a few weeks after that was they actually awarded a um, company, maybe not in the U S they should have probably, but they did a, a, a big infusion of like a, I think a $30 million infusion to a company, a startup out in Brazil, right? So it was part of that fund. That fund is not just looking at the U.S., but looking in general how to make uh, certain verticals a little bit more, you know, um, culturally diverse, to your point, yeah. you know? And uh, so, yeah, it is, it is a challenge. Um, I, I agree with you that people are scratching the surface only. And I hope that this does sort of bring up the narrative and enlighten um, what's happened over the last couple of months for corporate America to see that uh, there is a real issue and a problem and it has to start at the top. I agree hundred percent. You know, it's one thing to, to do it for a media play. Another thing is if you, if you really want to put your, um, you know, kind of like walk the walk, then yeah. you show it through the board, right? You follow the money. You show that your board is diverse. Yeah. You show that your executive team is diverse and not get into this group think mentality, which I think is what not all organizations suffer from, but there are certain industries that are stuck in this groupthink mentality because they only hire a, a certain type of candidate and they might miss out on the innovation. And this is what I want to get into and segue into everything you do, which is innovation strategy. Yeah. Um, you know, there's tons of research from Harvard, uh, Deloitte, uh, PCW. I mean, just great organizations that have done tons of research around diversity in the workforce and how it spurs innovation and growth and turns into world-class employee-centric, but also customer-centric organizations. So 
with this, I want to dive into your world and your world is all about innovation and strategy at the corporate yeah. level. So tell us a little bit about that and what you're doing at Territory Co. plus what you've done in other organizations. Yeah, I mean, so so my whole um, process is rooted in design thinking. And we kind of led into that early talking about this idea of empathy. And it's really putting your customer or your stakeholder at the center of, of everything you build. And it's really going back to this idea that if you know, if we want to build good products and we want to build things that people care about, we have to do it with a team. We can't do it in a silo. And um, if you've, you know, if you've kind of studied up on anything in innovation and kind of where it's going, um, it used to be very individualized. But now we're finding that that's not the case anymore. Indi innovation is very team based. So it's all about getting the team together and getting the best and the brightest people together. And then and then we draw. We we uh, put as many bad ideas up as we can to get to the good ideas. And then we really let those good ideas take shape and win. And so a lot of times um, my job is not to have all the innovative ideas. It's not to be deep in every single market, but it is to have the facilitative prowess to bring all the right people into the room and really pull out of them and extract out of them their knowledge, their ideas, what's going on in their head and their heart, and then really bringing to life what the customer needs. Because we know if we can solve what the customer needs, we have a product, we have a market, we have a solution. And so it's, it's every day, if we're not empathizing with the customer and what they're going through, we're missing a huge opportunity in our business. So a, a lot of what you, you, you say and what I heard you also say with Sangram's um, live, was around kind of a, a strategy or uh, that, that is customer centric, like you said, but it also sounds to me like almost it's like a category creation or subcategory. So you might be familiar with uh, Christopher Lockhead and his books, Play Bigger and Niche Down. And they kind of go into that, which is you got to start with how are you different in the marketplace, but how are you different in the point of view of your customer? So not just your product because you think your product will work, right? So yeah. he has great examples in the book, but he describes how, you know, obviously we know what happened with, um, you know, the transformation of the gig economy with the Ubers and the Airbnbs and what happened with the Marriott's and what happened with kind of taxis in New York and all over the country and the world, right? So can you describe, because I know you've got, uh, you know, different steps that are part of this innovation process uh, at a corporate level. Yeah. I mean, so... Yeah, if you back up and kind of look at the market, I want to I want to kind of hit on what you said too because that's really important. Um, you talked about this shift that's happening, right? You look at what happened to Blockbuster <laughs> versus Netflix, or like you said, what happened to taxis versus Uber, and there's this, and, and even what's going on with Amazon right now, right? So we're in the midst of COVID and civil unrest and all these other things that are going on, racial tensions in our in the U.S. and you know you look at Amazon, it's just surging right now. Um, we're really where they've leaned in if we kind of pop the top on, on their organization and, and what underpins it. There's so much uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, robotics and information. You know, they have over 100,000 robots that um, that they use to, to get through their day to day to, to do what they need to do. And what we know is like it's moving to where robotic automation of jobs is coming. So a lot of times I think what happens is in organizations, we get very focused on how much money we're making today. We get so focused on today that we're not creating the future. And so if you lean into some of these big areas like robotics or even um, battery technology, energy storage, blockchain, you know, cryptocurrencies, mobile payments, like smart cities using internet of things, like all of these things are coming. And the fear that I have for a lot of large organizations is they are not disrupting themselves. So they're going to be disrupted. And what, what they're disrupted by is the, either the economy or what's happening now with COVID or a number of different things where they're not thinking ahead. They're not looking into the future and they're not creating their future. So now a future is being created for them and it's not a future they like. And I think when COVID hit, it created a future a lot of companies did not like. And I, I believe in this season, many companies are gonna fall and many new companies are gonna be created because they're thinking about disrupting themselves before they're disrupted. Yeah, that's great insight. And it reminds me of 
Uh, Dr. Michael James, who's a VC, um, you know, a, a incredible VC venture capitalist out in uh, Silicon Valley, um, talked about um, basically it's the backwards of forecasting. So, you know, he called it the forecasting where you're going into the future. So you're looking at your organization seven years into five years into post COVID or whatever COVID becomes. And you're thinking about how your organization is working at that moment in time. And then you're working backwards to say, what do we need to do to innovate to be at that point? Now he, he likened it like, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing to do. Oh, very few companies have the leadership to do that. Uh, the apples of the world that had visionaries like Steve Jobs did that, right? So they, they looked at something like what Nokia was building and they, and they saw something four or five years into the future and started from that point working on their innovation and the product design, right? Yeah. Thinking yeah. what the customer, anticipating what that customer would look like, right? So I, I think it's one of those things where you're, it, the, the way he likened it was like, you've got to be both a pragmatic you know, needing to work in the moment on what you would do for a roadmap on a product and, and marketing and go to market strategy, all that. But at the same time, be almost like a fiction writer where you're, you're in la la land, right? Yes. You're able to yeah. look into the future and be almost a futurist and play in that world. Uh -huh. So there's very few leadership teams and even entrepreneurs that have those abilities. How would you say that they can hone in on those abilities? Yeah, this is like one of the most important things I think that, you know, your listeners need to take away. If you're a leader, you have to be a futurist. You know, one of the reasons I founded this thought leadership platform, Innovation Meets Leadership, is because I have found that, you know, some of the things, the two things that people lack the most of what I've seen in corporate is either they really struggle on the leadership side, so that emotional intelligence, all that stuff, or they struggle with innovation, the ability to create the future. And if you're a leader, you should naturally be able to think in that in that vein of creativity and innovation. And so some of the ways that I that I think you can do that in two just really practical ways, go talk to 20 customers, you know, when I think about early in my career, I didn't feel very creative, but I sure could pick up a pattern, right? So if I went and spoke to 20 customers and you know, 15 of them complained about the exact same thing, I knew that I had a, an idea. Was it my own idea? No way, it was the customers. They were telling me what they wanted and I just needed to go figure out how to create it in a way where it was urgent enough for them to buy today. So that's, you know, first way is go talk to customers. I think that's a beautiful way to just surface things that are needs. And then I think the other, the other way is just to spend so much time reading. I think sometimes we get so enfolded into our corporate jobs that we don't take time to invest into ourselves. And I think when you take time to understand the market, understand what's going on, you know, go read about how we're trying to put a space station on Mars right now, right? And then like, we're trying to figure out how to land on Mars and do all this stuff. So if there's somebody out there thinking about that, what is it that you should be thinking about in your area of responsibility? And, and something I love to do. So, um, when I worked in the auto industry, I found that they were typically about 10 years behind the tech industry. So anything you offered in the auto industry seemed like it was like, wow, where'd you come up with that? So sometimes jumping industries is also very That's powerful it. to get outside of the industry that you live in day to day and go read about some things that are happening in other industries and figure out now, how do I merge that into what I'm doing today? Yeah, I love that about looking at what's happening in other industries and then kind of having, to your point, that creativity and vision to translate how those changes that disruption that's happening could be a disruption you could create within your own industry before it actually takes over your, 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 your market share. Yeah. Now, that's great insight. By the way, I, I misspoke. Uh, uh, Dr. James, Dr. Michael James, it was backcasting. I think I said decasting. I don't know what the heck I was talking about. <laughs> that sounds almost like a, talking about uh, man, uh, auto manufacturing. It sounds like something in auto manufacturing. But anyhow, right. it's backcasting and it goes to what you were saying. So yeah, that's one way to try to be uh, kind of ahead of the curve. Now, when you think about innovation, I always think about like a Simon Sinek in terms of innovation is always something that starts with a why, right? So talk through what you think are healthy whys that organizations at the leadership level should be, you know, should be asking or should be inquisitive about to get to that innovation um, kind of mindset. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I feel like um, our why has to be greater than our what. And a lot of times we focus on the what, you know, 
what do I want to do? What, how do I want to execute that? We do a lot of that, but we don't have that why. And I think the danger is sometimes when you don't have a why, you can kind of be like that hired mercenary, that hired gun, that depending on you know who's willing to pay you what, you'll go wherever. But I think your why grounds you. It gives you grounding and it gives you focus. And so I think as as leaders, as you know, as entrepreneurs, we always have to go back to why. Why am I doing this? What's my passion? And it's what what's waking me up every morning to actually go embark on this work. And I will say this: like I didn't find my why overnight, but man, when I found it, it gave me guardrails. And it told me what I was going to do and what I wasn't going to do. And I think we've got to build that, you know, in our world and then let that why drive you towards what you're passionate about and what you want to create. Yeah, that, that's some great insight. You know, now we know that leaders are readers, right? Yes. And uh, I can imagine you, you've got a healthy bookshelf there somewhere in your, in your yeah. office, your house, your you know, house office. What have been some of these books that you're reading now or have read? that you would encourage others um, in, in a leadership role or looking to get into a leadership role to read? Okay, so I've, I brought my books because um, <clears throat> I just wanted to share them with you. So one of the business books that I think is really critical, have you read this one, Scaling Up? No, I have not. It literally takes well. all these other business books and puts it in one book for you. Like how powerful is that? So instead of going out and reading 20, 30 books, you're going to find everything you need to know kind of about business and especially operating your business mm -hmm. all in one book. And what I love about this book is that I originally get all my books on audio, but this one I had to buy because it actually walks you through specific things on like how to, how to create processes and how to attach people in the organization to those processes. How do I come up with a one year strategy, a five year strategy? Boom. This, this like gives you all of that. Love it. Love it. The other book yeah. that I love is From Impossible to Inevitable. Have you read this book? No. Okay. Aaron Ross. And it's all about how SaaS and other hyper growth companies create predictable revenue. So again, like if you're interested in entrepreneurship, one of the first things that you're asking yourself is how do I create predictable revenue? So Absolutely. Love, love, love that book. And the last book I'm going to share, The Art of Opportunity. So this book was actually written by one of the founders of Territory Global and or two of the founders of territory global and it is beautifully designed like this book is just so cool but it actually walks you through how to design your ecosystem workflows yeah like how to set up a, a map product. yeah how to think about it and so there's just some those are like my go-to books um that i go back to all the time like i love reading so i'm probably reading two or three books a month but i have my go-to books that i'm constantly re-referring to because there's so much meat in there that you just can't nuggets nuggets of gold yeah. yeah no i love it and thanks for sharing those you know i've been like i said i've been reading um niche down which is for those that are trying to get into subcategories or redesigning a category um okay. great uh you know kind of a, a, a unique points of view from the customer's perspective and, and coming out with something new right so i've been That's doing a lot of reading on that which is christopher lockhead plus some of the books in the back there um, you know, obviously, um, you know, Drift, which is a, a, a SaaS phenomenon. I've been following them and working with them for three years as a reseller. So their book on conversational marketing, as well as the philosophy that they have, a corporate philosophy of, you know, Elias Torres, one of the founders, you know, he, his is a whole, you know, um, the American dream come true story too. From Nicaragua, came as an immigrant with his two parents, uh, with his bro two brothers and his mom. And, uh, you know, went to University of South Florida, then from that to Harvard, from Harvard to IBM, IBM to HubSpot, and four other companies later, and then oh, Drift, wow. right? So incredible stories. And, and what he likes to say is something you said, which is, you know, his philosophy is, I build, you know, I build great teams first, product second. So yeah. Yeah. that whole idea, like you said, of in the leadership, your why has to be stronger than your what. Mm -hmm. So the why is build a great team that yeah. is answering that customer need, right? Whether that's a product, a service, and then working backwards, sort of re reverse engineering that versus trying to go after just the product because of a market share or because there's X amount of billion cap on that industry. So yeah. really great insights. I'm glad you shared those books because in, in the podcast, we're on the show notes. I'm, I'm making sure that every, every one of my guests is, they're put, I'm putting their hype song on. We'll get some motivated. <laughs> And I'm putting the books they're reading because I think you're right. Um, reading is important. If you could read, 
you know, at least one, one book a month or yeah. do a little bit of audio bites. Um, question, when you're reading, do you, I, I'm just curious, when you're reading, right? And all of a sudden, uh, a thought, like, a, like an Oprah Winfrey aha moment comes out, <laughs> right? You're like, holy yeah. crap. Do you quickly then stop? Oh, yeah. You know, um, what, what do you do to take that and then bring it into an actionable you know, yeah. to do or to an item. I think that's important to tell our, our listeners as well. What do you do with reading versus um, not, not for the sake of reading, but how do you then apply what you're reading? Yeah. So a lot of times, like you said, you're reading and you get this like, oh my gosh, this is, this is a huge thought. This, this thought matters. I usually stop and I just pull up my notepad on, on Apple and I'll just dictate not what they said, but what it sparked in me. And, and to me, that's the difference between knowledge, which is just collecting information and wisdom, which is taking that knowledge and figuring out how to apply it. So I try to not plagiarize. I try to get inspired and say, okay, this is the, the nugget, but this is what it made me think about. And so I'll actually get that into my notepad and then I'll email it to myself. And then later on, I'll start blogging about it. And so when that's I blog great. about it, it takes that idea from just a thought that's kind of floating around that will be fleeting if I don't capture it to yes. something that I can wrestle to the ground and say, this is why this is so powerful. You know, I read this, but here's what it sparked in me. Like, here's what it created. Here's, you know, here's what it reminded me of, or, or it's making me think about. And so really like if, if you can get into a place where you can write down your thoughts, they become more real and then they become more actionable. I love it. Great, great little tip and insight for those who love reading on how they can turn that, that, you know, that knowledge into wisdom. I love the way you frame that. So now, you know, that segues a little bit into besides obviously consuming, um, you know, books and you're a speaker as well at conferences and you're a consultant and you get a lot of feedback and input from different industries and different leadership what are you seeing right now amidst what we're all going through in this global pandemic as trending, trending in um, leadership and innovation, trending in maybe workforce, you know, um, gearing up for the AI that's already here, right? We yeah. know it's already here, but the AI of the knowledge economy, as that yeah. starts to catapult into version 3.0 or whatever it is, mm -hmm. what are you seeing that's trending that you would tell your audience? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I kind of always look at it twofold. I look at what's trending from a leadership perspective, and then I kind of look at what's trending from an innovation perspective. So I do think empathy is trending from a, a leadership perspective as we've all been thrust into our homes. And as a leader, you have got to have a pulse on your team. You have to understand what they're going through. You have to understand what they're facing. And, and one thing I, I want to say very clearly is that this pandemic has put a lot of pressure on women, especially women who have kids. And so being more flexible, understanding, you know, what does that mean? Like, for example, you know, my husband went back to work several weeks ago. And so now I'm at home with a 10 year old and a five year old. So I'm having to figure out how do I balance my day to day and get work done while also taking care of their needs and making sure that, you know, they're okay. And so there's a lot of um, challenge in that, that we're facing in this season. So applying grace, understanding what people are going through and being able to meet them where they're at and help them as a leader, I think is, is critical. Um, if you look at innovation, I mean, I think what's trending right now is just, um, the fact that we're seeing some some really big companies get bigger and there's a call to you know break those companies up there's been a call to break up amazon there's been a call to um you know yeah because they're, they're getting so huge right now what do you do with that um and then i think there's a call to um you know to really invest in some of these areas now in in the area of automation and robotics today uh, when you think about you know robotics um that economy is like a $28 trillion economy and it's going to jump to probably 40 something trillion. And so, you know, what we're seeing is a, a speeding up of automation and we're seeing a speeding up of robotics and some of these services. And so I think putting, putting those things into your purview, like if, if you're a company that is in the software industry or in the manufacturing industry, these are all things that, you know, we've got to think about yesterday. And so if we're not thinking about them and we're not understanding how they play into our business, if we're not looking at, you know, digital transformation, um, I won't name any of the companies, you know, but some of the companies I've worked at were on such, you know, um, 
legacy software that it would blow right. your mind, right? And just sure. the fact that, you know, you input that software in 1970 and you're still trying to support that software from 1970 is terrifying. But there's, there's, you know, we're always surprised when we get in the bowels of the ship with these large corporations that they haven't transformed to the speed that you would expect. And a lot of that's because it's too, you know, it's too effective with what they're doing now. It's just working. And so until it stops working, that's unfortunately, that's the point where people make the shift. And I think, you know, you've got to think about how to disrupt your organization before it's disrupted. I love that. I would argue that also as our economy, our knowledge economy and our skill economy is taking off and at a global scale. So, right, this is not just US, right? You look at emerging markets like Asia, Pacific, EMEA, you look at Latin America even, right, um, is also uh, taking off in, in certain sectors, SaaS and, and others. Um, I think the educational system, right, that you and I were fortunate to go through what we thought was, a, 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 I guess, a, 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 a good experience and a, a normal type of go from college, get your degrees, your master's, get maybe an internship or two, get into a, a, a corporate position and then work the ladder that's changed drastically, right? And I'm not talking about just the global pandemic and, and that on our graduating classes around the country and the world, but in terms of what are we really preparing our students that are in college right now for a workforce that is evolving, changing, and it's surpassing what they're learning. So I know that right now, if we're looking at people to fill in AI type positions, data analytics, there's tons of boot camps that are kicking butt to your traditional four-year college or even a graduate program. So what have you seen there that you see as a shift? Yeah, I mean, I think the education industry is having to shift in a big, big way. I mean, you look at MIT and Harvard creating edX, which is where you can go to take some of the same classes that people are taking at Harvard and MIT. And they've kind of said, let's democratize in a, you know, innovation, let's democratize education. I think that a lot of other education systems need to move there yesterday because they will begin to be irrelevant. And, and in a world where you are looking at all these founders who had some college or maybe no college <laughs> still, you know, they blow up and create these mega corporations. It's the idea that it's not about, you know, these buildings housing information anymore. It's, it's, we are in the, the age of information. And so people can get access to whatever they need. Like I think about my 10 year old, she's the best coder in her school and she's 10. And so, you know, I could probably put her work to work tomorrow doing something for me and not even think twice about it if there weren't child labor laws. But like that idea that like, you know, you don't have to have this traditional upbringing yeah. and you don't have to have this pedigree, like that's a really motivating thing, I think for many people. And so, you know, you know, I'm going to take it kind of to what's happening today in our country, you know, I think that there are multiple sides of, of how people feel about, you know, what's going on racially and mm -hmm. um, growing up, you know, as a minority, you know, my father was very clear with me about the, if you spend so much time thinking about the past and what you didn't get, you will never create a future for yourself. And so, you know, people ask him all the time, well, you know, how did you become a successful black man? And he's like, cause I think of myself as a man, not as, a race or not as of this or not as of that. I try not to put myself in categories. I try not to put myself in boxes. And that's why it's so important to break the box, whatever box we're in educationally, you know, there's so much information and access out there today. Um, you know, I think about in India, when I studied there, students would get on a bus to the point where hands and legs are hanging out the windows to get to school. Like it was by any means necessary, they were going to create a better life than they had for themselves. If given that opportunity, they were going to go the distance and do whatever it took. And so there's just a fire that I think, you know, we have as Americans and we need to call on it because, you know, the idea that, that we can start from nothing and make something of ourselves, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And sometimes when you don't, when you keep knocking at the door and it's not opening, create your own door. Yeah, I love that. And um, I would say that, yeah, edX um, it has democratized a bit of 
the the digital divide in terms of educational access. Um, funny enough, my wife also we have a a a, a, a six year old and three year old, so I totally empathize with you. And she's also a working parent, uh, as I. Uh, she's got an e commerce business, and uh, my hat goes off to all the women, especially mothers and working mothers that are out there right now, because it is a lot. You know, to your point, what you were saying. And as leadership, you need to show empathy um, at the very least. Um, in regards to the educational system, um, I think that, yes, uh, the education system, and I worked in it, by the way, for a long time, and also sold into it, uh, LMSs and, and such, um, even though they've innovated with things like, you know, online education, hybrid education, the curriculum itself, and I think the cost has been a burden on many, many Americans um, that even if they go to four-year college, you know, you're not going to make that back up in the first year or second year, right? Um, and, and it's still not, I think, cutting edge enough to, to really, um, you know, justify. I'm having conversations and thoughts with my wife about what I want the path to be for my, you know, my sons, Nico and Ethan, right? Um, I think creativity is something that is even more difficult to get out of the education system. Um, irregardless of where you go, right? So I, I, I think that the doubling down on creativity is something people are not so in tune with. You know, at, at corporations, you'd never see any kind of workshop around creativity. They're yeah. typically around everything that's pragmatic, that can be measured, yeah. you know, because we're so into the numbers that we lose sight of the fact that, you know, if, if we focus a bit more on the creativity, we'll get some, um, you know, we'll get, we'll get some meaningful, I think, ideation going that could turn into the next disruption that can turn into the next big thing. Right. So I agree with you. I love the fact that you're already thinking that way. Um, so now, you know, this segues into me thinking about if you, and we all would love to be able to jump on Michael, you know, with Michael J. Fox into the DeLorean and go back in time. Right. So if you can do back to the future, yeah. Um, what would you tell your younger self, your younger Natalie on, on what to do, um, what pitfalls to avoid, what yeah. would you say? Gosh, I mean, so much I think I would say to myself, I don't know if I would per se change anything, but I would have this talk with myself about fear. I think that, um, you know, there are core lies that we believe in our life because um, of something that happened to us when we were growing up, whether it was rejection or trauma, there's all these core lies that we kind of carry with us. And there's fear, right? The fear of man, the fear of being fired, the fear of losing your livelihood, the fear of even being embarrassed, right? In a meeting. Um, there's the fear of being made of a fool or exposed or this idea that you're an imposter, right? Like, do you even belong in this room? I think there's all these fears that we have and I would encourage myself to expose those fears sooner and embrace kind of the, the challenge of what it looks like to get to the other side of it. Um, growing up, because I grew up in um, a neighborhood that where there was no diversity, um, I had a fear of kind of like being made a fool of because uh, oftentimes I was called out for my race and made fun of because of my race. And it's interesting that I carried that into places that it didn't need to stay. And I think oftentimes, you know, we have to go back to our childhood to understand the mechanics of what holds us back in life. And when we go back to our childhood, we understand that someone played a tape for us, but then we become our own abuser and we continue to play that tape long after that person's gone. And so uh, facing that tape, facing what happens and, and telling yourself that, you know, you're not an imposter, be true to who you are and, and be true to who, you know, you're called to be. That is like, to me, the biggest advice I would give myself, just embrace who you are because there's only one you, right? There's only one you on this earth and there'll never be anyone like you. There's nobody that will ever have your fingerprint. And there's something really powerful about understanding that and embracing that. I love that. And it made me think of, um, you know, recently, unfortunately, we lost a great one in sports in, in uh, Kobe Bryant. And Kobe Bryant, I was lucky enough, I lived four years in California and got to see him once because uh, it's super expensive. And it was almost like a comp from a, a, a one of my vendors, <laughs> but uh, at the Staples Center. So incredible athlete and an incredible person as well. And he had a philosophy called the Mamba, you know, um, and it's basically what you just said, fear, right? to be fearless, the opposite. You're, 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 your fear is your own worst 
you know, kind of enemy in terms of creating who you really are meant to be and to go after the goals to avoid that whole idea of imposter syndrome, to not put the roadblocks yourself. Uh, it's not even other people. You yourself sometimes put it with the, with the F word, with fear. Yeah. So I love that, that you're thinking that if you were to go back and talk to your 20 something self, right? Um, tell me a little bit also about, so if you think about the people listening in, um, your peers, three takeaways that you would give them, three takeaways from this conversation and from your collective experience working at the big organizations plus right now with Territory Co. What would those be around innovation? I mean, I think around innovation, you know, it's the biggest things that hold us back. I think it is fear. And I think fear can become a toxic feeling in our everyday work, whether we're afraid of the environment we're in or we're afraid of, you know, some of the people that we have to interact with because it's not an enjoyable experience. That, that can happen a lot in corporate where we're just not enjoying the back and forth conversations we're having with people. And I think that that creates um, stressors in our brains, that creates a fight and flight or freeze in our brains, and then that kills creativity. So um, my, my request <laughs> for, for your listeners is that they would find places where they can carve out in their day or their week to close out all the noise, close out all the what ifs, all the fear, all the infighting that hap can sometimes happen in, in large corporate organizations and to allow yourself a space to dream and to just start dreaming. And because to me, when you're dreaming, you're not held back and there's not a fear of the future when you're dreaming. And sometimes when we're afraid of failing, we can't dream and we can't see what the future is. We can't create the future. And so we have to move ourselves physically out of this place of feeling like we're going to fail or fall. And we have to move ourselves into a place where we can dream and we can't live in those two places simultaneously. We have to choose. And so um, I would say, you know, if you're, if you don't have psychological safety in your nine to five, find places where you can carve out to dream because I find the best leaders are those who can create the future and those who can dream and see what's ahead. That's great. So t tell our, our listeners where they can find you if they need some, you know, input, uh, advice, and maybe even strategic consultation around innovation, where can they find you? Sure. So you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at innovation meets leadership. And then um, you can also check out the Innovation Meets Leadership site. And if you want to work with me, you can head over to Territory Global and check me out there as well. Great. Well, Natalie, it's been a true pleasure speaking with you on this podcast, a bit of an odd cast, I guess, Smart okay. Chickens.